How you doing, Scott? I'm chilling. How you doing? I'm great. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Representing. Welcome him to Toronto. My first time here in Canada. Wow. Well, I, we're, we're honored to have this happen here. It's a blessing to be here. So, you know, I just kind of want to bring it all the way back to the beginning. You know, I want to just talk about your, your life, really, at first. Um, so, you're, you're originally, you were, you were born in Long Island, is that correct? Yep, in Manhasset. Okay, and um, so you also, you have roots in South Florida as well, like plantation, you, you eventually moved yeah, there? Yeah, all over Florida, but um, as an infant, I moved from Long Island to Florida and grew up there. Cool, yeah, so... Um, what did your parents do? Your parents, your dad was a court reporter. Yeah. And your mother, she was actually also, she was an artist, right? I mean, she was a housewife, but she, early in her, you know, days, like 17, she was into music and had a little record deal for a while. Well, she was on, like, some labels and stuff, huh? right? Like, what was on Cameo? Cameo Parkway Records. Wow, right? you know your stuff, man. Yeah, man. No, I've, I've, been, I've been digging in the craze. So I'm trying to get my Nardwar on, you know? Like, <laughs> uh, and your uncle was in the band The Vagrants. Yep. So there's like a lot of music around you already from, from an early age, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering though if there was, um, if you ever got to see that kind of like music lifestyle like close up when you were younger in that way, like did you? I mean, my, I don't like our family gatherings and stuff. Um, my mom and my uncle and everybody would be singing and take turns and you know, I just, it was inspiring, so. And at that point you weren't just like jumping on the piano and stuff? Yeah, I was, I yeah, was trying. You, yeah, <laughs> but and Originally, back in the day, I believe there's a connection to to soccer as being one of the reasons why you ended up playing piano. Is, is this possible? Well, you know what? I, went, I was in soccer for like two seconds. Yeah. In like third grade. And um, I was I was sent home all the time for like leaving my shin guards home. And, <laughs> and I was just I wasn't into it. And I would go home and I would just play piano and just I would set up my little tape recorder on the piano bench and play like all these songs that I was learning in my head, you know, and just, it's crazy, just figure them out. And I believe there was a specific incident though where you, you got hit in the face with a cleat? Yeah. <laughs> and you like lost some teeth Sports or wasn't for me. You know? <laughs> and your mom was like, let me put him in, you know, some piano classes and try that. And then yeah. you really took to that. Well, I didn't take to piano lessons, but I took to piano. The, the piano teacher I had, he said I was unteachable. Really? Yeah, because I wasn't really interested in theory. I wasn't interested in anything, which, you know, it, it's just I'm like not a normal piano player. I just have my own system, and I play the piano like a drum, almost. Very percussive. Where, where does that come from, that, that, that I style? I have no like, idea. It's like... I think that lends itself really well to making beats, too. That, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's all my passion for music, and, you know, even like... Before I learned to play the piano, my brother and I used to like sit in front of the mirror and play like rock songs with tennis rackets and stuff and pretend we were like jamming. So. And you, you used to uh, do kind of like um, school kind of performances and stuff? Like I believe you were, you played the, the part of Travolta in uh, Greece? That was something that backfired on me because <laughs> I was looking to get out of class and like I found out, me and my friend found out that you can get passes to go rehearse during school. So we were like, oh, let's try and get a part or whatever. And then they made me the lead, so. <laughs> then I had to work. But yeah, you, used to, you and your brother used to like play songs and stuff during you know, the like talent shows and stuff. Yeah. 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 And so I'm pretty sure when you were like 12, 13, you were already starting to do like paid gigs at that time. Well, it's interesting because I had a friend in middle school and, um, I was at her house one day, and her father had you know, found out that I played piano well or whatever, and um, he said, can you play for my guest tonight? So I played for the people at his house, and when I was done, he gave me $100. And I was like, well, this is what I want to do for a living. What, what kind of stuff were you playing at that time? I don't know. I, I forget. Some, some songs. Billy Joel or something, probably. <laughs> Tight. Yeah. So... <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong with Billy Joel. That's very piano, right? You know, you know so um, your dad uh, had a lot of swag. Am I, am I correct in saying this? He had, you know, vibes, you know, like... It was cool. I feel like, you know, you know, in high school, you used to, you know, drive his Porsche to school. Is that, is that true? No, I stole it. You stole it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
And I'm trying to picture this, and like just from what I've I've read doing research, you know, you look pretty much the same as you do now. Like you were rocking shades, kind of like um like a Miami Vice kind of vibe. Pretty at much at that time. <laughs> yeah, you were like. 13, 14, 15? Yeah, I just wanted a pair of Carrera sunglasses at 12, and I just, I don't know. Like red leather jacket? Yeah. I had a fake Rolex and everything. As a, like, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm just picturing that. And this is like around when you had moved to Philadelphia, right? Yeah. No, it was way before this, that. That's before that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. This was like sixth grade, you know, fifth grade. And so when, when did you move to Philadelphia? At 15, I moved to Philly. My dad had to move for, you know, his job. And um, when we got there, it, the kids weren't really cool at the school. Like, I got beat up a couple of times because I, I came in in the middle of the year. They were like, oh, he's a narc, like, planted and whatever. I was like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> whatever. So I, just, I started cutting school and taking the train from the suburbs of Philly into the city. And I met this guy, Richard Nichols, who went on to become in, the manager of The Roots. And he kind of took me under his wing. Eventually, after my parents found out I wasn't going to school, they said, you either go to school and you can stay or you got to go. And I went. And I, I, you know, I, I did odd jobs and did whatever I had to do to support myself at 15, 16 years old. <clears throat> and I got a record deal with The Roots. <laughs> it just, it's believing in what you do. And so you knew the, the eventual manager of The Roots, but were you like interacting with anyone from the band at that point yet? Or like, when did you actually he, meet them? He told me I gotta go over to this house in Germantown, Pennsylvania and um, go audition. And I went by myself and it was this guy, um, uh, Questlove and you know, <laughs> yeah, he was in school still and everything, you know, we were kids. and. Um, I showed up, because the only keyboard I could afford at the time, which is a keyboard that's very popular now and very expensive, but at the time, nobody wanted it. Everybody wanted a synth, and I wanted a Fender Rhodes. And it had like two broken keys on it, and it just had this cool sound, and Questlove went crazy, and he couldn't believe that I was using that keyboard. What was the keyboard? The Fender Rhodes. Oh, it was it's a like Fender a, Rhodes? Yeah, okay. electric piano. Yeah. yeah. And it's just a warm, vintage sound. It actually became the main tone center for what the roots became was that keyboard. Amazing. So, you know, you're meeting with them in Germantown, like, are, at what point do you start, you know, jamming with them? Like, yeah, well, they put me to the test, you know, I mean, I had to set up and, and you know, start playing for them, and then eventually Questlove got on the drums and it just felt natural. And, you know, I was, it was culture shock for me, you know what I mean? I, like, was, like, catapulted into this um, neo soul, uh, you know, native tongue world of hip hop in Philly, and I'm just a little white boy from South Florida. This but, would be in like 1991, 92, or something. Yeah, right? 92. So this is before people would even use the term neo soul. This is just, yep. you know, this is even a time when it was like we created that way. You created that, yeah. Yeah. And this, this would it was even weird to be like a rap band at this time. There was nobody checking for. A, a band at that time to get signed. Wendy Goldstein believed in it. Um, she's at Republic now, but at the time she was at Geffen Records, and to a you know a group with no hit and nothing like anything else that was going on in the world, she gave us a million dollar record deal. It was a blessing. It's it didn't like go in our pockets, <laughs> but records cost a lot of money in those days to make. Like, you know, you had two-inch tape. You could, tape, yeah. And studio calls, it was crazy. And so at that time, like, how are you explaining this music to, you know, like your family or like other people too? Like it's, you're playing in a band, but they're a rap group too. Yeah. And I mean, it was nothing like it, but short after we came out, a bunch of groups started coming out with live bands, like the Diggable Planets and then the Goats and other people. There were like some that were also on Geffen too. Right, yeah. that came after it, that they kept mm -hmm. like signing other people. Yeah. Um, I think this is a good time to play a track. I'm gonna play a song that you also have um, production credit on, and this is Proceed by The Roots. Yeah, that's where it started. So yeah, just um, being The Roots, like 
what did what did you, what would you say you learned from working with somebody like Questlove? Because I know he's he's how like to keep a, time. <laughs> <laughs> he's like a, a human drum machine. It's amazing, yeah, and just learning all the rhythms and you know how to keep the energy of the beat going, and you know being around. My first experience, really, with a, cl a close relationship with the MC being Black Thought and Malik B, that set the bar really high. Like Absolutely. High. Absolutely. You know, Black Thought's like the rapper's rapper, you know? Yeah. Um, so I I'm trying to wonder, like, at what point did you transition from, you know, you're, you're playing keys with the roots to being like, I'm going to be producing beats as well, you know? You know, being a band member is cool, but... You know, I wanted to expand on the music that I make. And I loved being in the studio. And that sound that we created was amazing. And I realized, though, there's a whole world out there. And I wanted to, you know, cross over to the other side, the, you know, the more commercial side of music and instead of the tastemaker, you know, Neil Sill stuff and, um, you know, I, I got a little bit of criticism from the core family of the Roots at the time, like saying, what are you doing? And then when I went, obviously, I don't, not to jump ahead, but I went to work with Dre, you know, everybody was like, you're working with him 10 years too late. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, history. We were just getting started. <laughs> that, that, that's funny. Um, was there anyone, though, specific that made you want to make that shift? you know, to, to becoming a producer? And did anyone that you saw, like, in the early days of, you know, playing around with the roots or meeting people in the industry, like... You know what? I don't think it was so much that. I think it was hearing myself one too many times referred to as the guy who plays keys in the roots. And I was composing, at that time, the majority of the music for the group. <clears throat> so I wanted more of that, and I wanted, you know, to create a name for myself as a record producer, mm -hmm. mega producer. Yeah. And we only get as far as we dream and as we imagine. I like that mega producer. Usually you hear super producer, no, but that's producer. not enough. Mega. I'm feeling that. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, just from the Philadelphia era, is um, you worked at a studio briefly at some, in, in some capacity too? Like what, stu what studio was this? I was interning, like I interned at Rough House Records at, at um, Studio Four. Okay. At the time when Cypress Hill and uh, Criss Cross and the Fugees, Lauryn Hill, all that stuff was happening. And it was all some simultaneous as I was in the roots and I was just trying to like be everywhere at the same time. Like what kind of stuff were, were you doing there? Were you learning anything that like would lead into your production? I was cleaning ashtrays. <laughs> And it was weird, just as we got our record deal, I was still working there um, with The Roots, and I, w I was still working at Studio Four, and I was supposed to be cleaning up a studio and prepping in the room, and, and um, I got caught playing the piano in the live room. And I thought I was gonna get fired, but I got called down to play keys down the hall on my first record, on my, you know, that to ever come out, you know. And what was that? It was the remix for Killing Me Softly for Lauryn Hill with Bounty Killer. Yeah. I made 300 bucks <laughs> and I was happy. Amazing. Yeah. But you know, you, you go from doing that to, you know, you're getting more and more involved with the roots to the point where you make this, you know, hugely iconic track, you know, and it all stemmed from you just playing some piano and I think Black Thought hearing it, you know. No, actually, this, I'll sorry. tell you what happened. I had left the group mm -hmm. and I was, I got my own studio upstairs from where the Roots record at Sigma Sound. Mm -hmm. And um, I was working with this girl, Jill Scott. She was working at uh, Urban Outfitters at the time. And she wanted me to help her make some music for her stuff so she could get a deal. So we came up with this song, You Got Me. It was pretty much all the way done. And Questlove came in and said, I have to have this for our album, for Things Fall Apart. And um, it was 1997, I remember. And uh, I gave it to them and, and 
I was assuming that Jill would be on the record, and at the last second, the label decided to throw Erica Badu, and uh, we won a Grammy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I just, <laughs> I just want to, I want to play that song. So, you got me by the roots. So just listening to a track like that, um, you know, had you, you, you totally compuse, com composed all the music for, for that particular beat, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's like, I don't know, like just as a listener, you know, sometimes it's hard to figure like, oh yeah, so it's a band, so maybe like multiple people are writing this or whatever, like, so it's just, yeah. it's interesting. What was the process for you, like, to come up with that beat in particular? I mean, there was, obviously there was add-ons after the fact that we, you know, uh, but... To start it, I just came up with these chords, and I did it, you know, Jill and I did it low. I call it Lennon and McCartney style, um, where we sit at the piano. I play, somebody has a pad, we create melodies, we create chords, and then the production comes second. But, you know, we have a generalized tempo in mind and a feel, so I just programmed the drums around that, and bass, and, you know, emulated a bass guitar on the keys. And then Hub came in and he replayed it after the Roots accepted it. And then Questlove as well redid the drums with the same pattern that I created. And then he came up with this idea for the end of the record to put jungle music, the drum and bass break in there. Right. And then took it a step further and attempted to play it live, <laughs> which <laughs> had never been done before at that tempo. I think that's kind of the magic of the Roots. It's like this combination of you know, very organic, traditional music, but then, like, just some weird ideas in there, too. Yeah. Um, so that song definitely worked really well. You know, wins the Grammy um, Best Rap Performance by a duo or group in 2000. Um, did you, you go to the Grammys for that? I did not. No. <laughs> but, like, what was the... Uh, when you ended up winning, you know? No, it was, was amazing. Like? Amazing feeling. And, uh, you know, that's inspiring. That's what really pushes you to keep going and you know seeing that people like your music and it makes you gives you a confidence and makes you believe what's it like just you know you know you, you everywhere you go you're hearing the song it's like hugely popular song like you know you know it's crazy i have a story about that <laughs> i remember in philly driving around in my car and <clears throat> even though you know we were successful somewhat in you know the fact that we had a song on the radio, it hadn't hit to us financially. And I remember I saw somebody in the car playing the song and I, they pulled up next to me and I was like stressing out <laughs> how I was gonna pay my cell phone bill or something stupid. And it was just like, you know what, it's gonna be good. So all you artists out there, it's gonna be all right. It gets greater yeah. later. And so the same year that that song came out, you know, another massively huge song that you're involved with came out. And I'm just wondering, how did you get involved with Dr. Dre? <laughs> That's a crazy story. Um, I went to do a jam session with The Roots in L.A. It was my first time ever going to California. And it was at the Martini Lounge. And we were doing a, a women in music series. It's like, you know poetry and rap for women called The Black Lily. And um, I ran into a girl that I knew from Philly in LA. She had, I had lost touch with her, but it was Eve, her lyricist. Even. And you know, she ran up to me, she was like, yo, I got a record deal with Dr. Dre. This is prior to her going with Rough Riders. And she's like, yo, you were always really cool to me. I want to take you to meet Dre. But I had no music with me whatsoever, so I didn't know what I was going to play him. All I had was, you know, my fingers. So, he, you know, he said, I hear you play them keys real good. <laughs> After I waited for like two hours in the lobby, like nervous. <laughs> and um, he literally changed my life that day. Yeah. And so from, from then to making Still Dre, I mean, how long... Did you literally compose it as soon as you... Well, you know, I sat there at the piano and he said, listen, I want you to stay in California. He knew I was going back to Philly. And he, you know, 
gave me some money and a hotel I could stay at. And then the next day we came in and we didn't actually work on The Chronic, but we worked on uh, um, Eminem, this song, Just the Two of, you, two of Us. And um, it's crazy. He's like, yeah, I got this new MC coming in. I wasn't <laughs> expecting Marshall Mathers to come in the tour. And it was amazing. And then the day after that, we composed uh, Big Egos from The Chronic album. It was pretty crazy. Sick. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to seize the day. I had to hit it out the park the first days with him, and it changed it. I think that's the amazing thing about, you know, working with legends and stuff. It's like you have opportunity to, like, make a good impression, and, yeah. you know, you want to you wanna seize that. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to play a totally iconic track, Still Dre by Dr. Dre. I guess it. <clears throat> I guess it wasn't ten years too late. <laughs> uh, no, definitely not. Um, yeah, it, well, it was. It was weird in the public sense. People were like, "When is this album coming?" You know, it's been so long since the first Chronic. Like people before that track came out, people were, were a little skeptical, right? But then that was. It was. It was almost. In my opinion, it was even even better. Yeah. You know, it was. It was just a seismic track. So tell me about making Still Dre. Still Dre, um, I remember I, we were sitting uh, in the studio and um, just throwing shit against the wall and see what would work. And Dre programmed this kick and snare. And I think his food arrived. <laughs> and he was within earshot, like right outside the control room was this kitchen area. And he was eating a sandwich. And I was just noodling on the piano and I started playing bling, bling, bling on top of this drum pattern that he had. And he poked his head in and he was like, that's it. At, by the end of the day, the song was shipped off to Jay-Z to, to pen and the rest is history. That is so cool. <laughs> like, there's something interesting about that song. I feel like there's like a certain um, it, it seems simple, right? It seems like there's something um, very familiar about it upon first listening to it. You know, it seems like, it reminds me in some ways of like chopsticks or something, right? But it's more complex than that. You know what it is? What is it? It's the sloppiness of it. Yeah. It's those intangible things I find that make songs like work or not work. Yeah. And the sonics of it. Well, yeah, you know, you're working with Dre. It's like just yeah. top flight, you know, just perfectly EQ'd everything. Is there anything that you learned about production from Dre? Yeah, I mean, just, it's, you know, just watching it every day. You absorb it, be around it. It makes you set the bar really, really high because, you know, some people think that everything they do is good. It's not, you have to find the magic. And we're not on every day. We're, as long as we're on most days, and we, you know what I mean? We work hard at it, the, the gems will come. Cool. So... You know, you're doing all these tracks with Dre in California. How are people really responding in Philadelphia? You were saying before, like, you know, some of the Roots camp were just, like, skeptical about it, but, like... I mean, I, I really wasn't playing too much for them, but when I, you know, because I did take a trip home. My trip home was to pack and move to L.A. Because <laughs> I had never left. Right. Um, and everybody was still skeptical. But, you know, proved the whole world. I mean, this was at a particularly like fraught time for rap culture because it was like, you it was it was us against them or whatever. It was like you know conscious rap or whatever you want to call it versus commercial rap. And at that time, people weren't listening to everything at the same time. Like you were either down with one or the other. Mm -hmm. And here you are, you know, making a track with like the Roots and then making this Dr. Dre. It was, I guess, kind of ahead of his time at that time. Yeah, I mean, Dre. I don't think he put the album out that people were expecting. It wasn't like, I mean, it was, all his music is gangster, but it wasn't a gangster rap album. It was a variety album that was done amazing. Yeah, it's like, you know, it had so many different styles and... Yeah, it was, and the, and the, the musicality of it and the production levels were undeniable, I felt. The Absolutely. mix and everything. Yeah, so you go off of, you know, working with Dre, when did you start working with Timbaland? You know what? There was a, a family, the Interscope family at that time. It, was, it wasn't just Dre. It was Dre there, and then they brought Timberland in. So 
it was all family. And, you know, I ran into him at the studio and he said, yo, come mess with me on some stuff. And he definitely brought different stuff out of me than I had ever done. And he wanted me to play things that way, you know, not the way I was used to playing. Just try some other stuff. And so, like, this, this environment, it was, it was pretty, like, collaborative. Like, it was the idea of, like, all these people working together in different rooms and stuff. Was it that kind of vibe or...? I mean, you know, different studios, but, you know, mm -hmm. it all led back to the same, you know, corporate structure, you right. know, with, with Interscope and Jimmy, and it was, it was a moment. So when did you start working on Crimea River? Like, how did that come, come to be? I got a call from Timberland. He said, I'm working with Justin Timberlake. I'm doing his solo album. I want you to come down and do a couple records with me. And what, what do you say to that at that time? Because he was the guy from NSYNC at yeah, that time. Yeah, no, I mean, I was, I was cool with it. I mean, I knew he was, he was the, to me, the best singer out of the group. And, you know, if Timberland's getting involved in it, it's going to be some, something fly, you know. And um, I just remember sitting in uh, Westlake Studios, and there was the control room, and then there was this little corridor that led to the live room, and we set up a Rhodes in that little room. It was like me and Justin and Tim sitting right there at the piano, and I just started playing. And it was another one of those situations where it was immediate, and we, we Cry Me a River happened. Okay, let me fire that up. Cry Me a River by Justin Timberlake. A lot of the best stuff just comes from creating this little chord figure or something unique in that, and uh, it might spark a melody idea from the writer, and then... He timbalized it. <laughs> like the, the beatbox kind of drums. That beat is obese. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. still too crazy. He killed that. He put in his work on that one. And then you can even see like the song structure too. Like I, I feel like just from analyzing songs, you can see how, how these songs became such big hits because it's like this new sound musically, but it has like the backbone of, of traditional like pop structure, you know, like the bridges and like all that stuff. But it under. does it without changing chords. And that was, that's some of the cool stuff that, like, being around guys like Tim and Dre, um, they help me harness what I do. And, like, I might have been coming at a perspective where maybe these chords should change for the pre-chorus or whatever. Do Sometimes overdo it with the writing mm -hmm. to compensate for other, whatever it is. And making the most of one chord figure and then finding ways to put other things around that and then take the chords out and bring them back, it's like... It was cool, just learning. It's very hip hop, right? Yeah. It's like you know, taking yeah. like one thing and just like, yeah, you know, bring it to another level. Um, so, are you still in, in touch with Tim Lin at all? Yeah, I yeah. talked to him like three days ago. Okay, that's good because yeah. I know he, you know, he back in the day he called you the piano man, you know, just he, over whatever. I'm glad he did. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I wear that with pride. I have a tattoo that says I'm the piano man. Because the piano is what I, that's my weapon of choice for producing records. I always thought it was kind of cool, actually. You know, I thought it was like a, something to be like proud of, you know? Yeah. yeah. It was a weird thing. There was, there was a lot of politics. There was some parties in Miami at the time, like people, not parties, but people that um, they, they wanted to create drama for their own gain. So they were telling Timberland that, you know, I was doing this and that, you know, and then going back to me and doing the same thing and trying to create trouble. And we figured it out with one phone call that that's what was happening and we just buried the hatchet. I feel like that's the thing with so much beef too, is it's like miscommunication and then it's, if you actually talk to the person, it's ever, never as big as it really is, you know? So I'm glad to hear that. Glad to hear they're good. Yes. Oh yeah. So another person that you've gotten to work with, and, and I feel like at this point we're getting more into um, songs that are like more primarily produced by you, you know, because I, I'm, is, is there a specific point in which that started happening more in, in your career? Or? Well, there was a point in 2005 where I watched Dr. Dre win Producer of the Year Award, and... Um, I, f I sat there in the Grammys and, I, I, you know, I was so happy for him and, and you know, he, he had been killing it and had such a run. And I was a big part of that run with him and I decided that I want to create my own, you know, world. And I moved to Florida and I started pursuing 
not to compete with what we were doing on the West Coast, but I was doing like, I started working on, you know, Christina Aguilera and Beyonce and just a different tier and it became a different phase in my, my career. You really also created like a totally new sound for rap too by doing this, you know? I feel like... My Miami sound. The Miami era. Yeah. I'm feeling that. You know? And I'm going to play one, one such song from this time. This is uh, Baby Boy, Beyonce and Sean Paul. Yeah, Sean Paul, an honorary Torontonian. If you know, you know. Um, yeah, so you got to tell me the story behind making this song because I feel like at this time, this is the, the next track where you're working with somebody who's more familiar with being in a group, right? This was Destiny's Child and then Beyonce's solo tracks, right? So what was it like working on that project? I mean, it was incredible to be included in that project and you know, with all the success that Destiny's Child was coming from. And Beyonce, <clears throat> she and I were put in a, a studio in South Beach and for like two weeks, and we created three number one songs, I think, <laughs> in that run. Naughty Girl as well. Baby Boy, and Me, Myself, and I. Yeah. And I got a chance to help out a good friend of mine, too, who was, you know, also trying to find his way in the music business. And he was one of our forefathers of rap. And he comes from Three Times Dope, the group, his, the rapper named EST. And, you know, it wasn't... <laughs> 10 years prior to this, he was a huge star. And now, 10 years later, he was just trying to find work. So I convinced Beyonce that he was a very experienced R&B songwriter. <laughs> And you know, I, 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 you know, I put my name on the line for him, but he, he showed up and he wrote all three of those songs with B. And uh, it's a blessing. I love hearing stories like that. <laughs> I feel like that's one of the most special things about music, you know, that, that you can like do things like that for people and then they come through, right? Yeah. I think that's really cool. Um, one thing I noticed in that beat, and I feel like it's become kind of a, a hallmark of, of a lot of your production is that there's kind of the like Middle Eastern influence. Yep. I'm wondering where, where that comes from. You know, it's like, I emulate a lot of the stuff that I listen to. Like, for example, when I was in The Roots, I was listening to Tribe Called Quest. So the, whatever they were sampling, I started playing stuff like that and I would try and capture that feeling. And I was listening to a lot of like Arabic and weird stuff at the time and I just, I got into it, so I taught myself how to play these weird scales that they have. Which is, the music is a little different, the Arabic music. They have more notes than we have in their scale. They have like half tones, you know what I mean? And I figured it out that I could use this little pitch bend wheel on the left to, to achieve that. I feel like stuff like that, those are kind of like compositional advantages that you can have as a producer. Do you think that's important, just like studying different kinds of music like that? And it's like having a bag of tricks, you know? I pulled different hats out from, you know, time to time. I unexpectedly found myself the other day <clears throat> in an Ariana Grande session and composing for her. And what was asked of me was to do some neo-soul roots type stuff oh. and killed it. It's crazy. <laughs> They got the right guy for the job. <laughs> you got the right one, baby. That's dope. Um, so yeah, so this is, for me, it gets into your like primary production period after the Beyonce tracks, they do so well. And then, you know, tell me how you originally met Fat Joe. I met Fat Joe in Rob Tulo in his office at Atlantic Records at the time. He goes by the name Reef. Sometimes he's also a producer. And um, tell you the truth, it was, it was hilarious because I had met him. He was like, yeah, this is Fat Joe. It was amazing. And it was a little teeny office. And when he came in, I was smoking some weed. And he was so funny. He was like so hilarious, Fat Joe. And he, his manager at the time, Macho, was like, I think you got him stoned. He doesn't <laughs> smoke. <laughs> Contact. Yeah, yeah, I gave him a contact. Yeah. <laughs> and so you start working with him. You start working with his group, Terror Squad. Yep. 
and you 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 hit again, big time. Was something that was not just a track, but it was also kind of like a dance too. Yeah, and it was just something people used to say, you know, like that. Lean back, mm-hmm. lean back. Yeah, I remember my boy Raul, who I you know he was hanging out with me in Miami. He was you know OG Terror Squad member. He dragged Joe out to my house, which was kind of far from like where the city and everything. So he had to like drive all the way out to the burbs to sit down with me. He didn't really know what was gonna happen, but we sat in 15 minutes after he was in my house, we made lean back. And I feel like this is interesting because I feel like that that sound was not what Fat Joe was known for, right? Like he he had the kind of uh, more street, you know, sample based, you know, primo kind of beats. In in the uh, in the '90s more, and I feel like this was like a big change of pace for him. It feels like it was like you know you're you're kind of getting into your own style at this time too. So it was like a combination of two people like doing something kind of new. Yeah, I mean he was definitely cheering me along and helping me sculpt it. And I, and I remember when we got done making the beat, he was like, "Now we need a big intro," and I was just boom boom boom. It was, just happened. And now I feel like this sound is now like synonymous with New York music now. So yeah. I'm going to put it on. Lean Back by Terror Squad. So I feel like just listening to that beat and a lot of the other productions that you've made, I find you make music that's very evocative. It's very like, I feel like that feels like I'm, you know in a mysterious temple or something. You know, like I'm, I'm, I can see a picture of, of the sound in my mind. And is that something when you're, when you're composing that you're, you're, you're picturing anything or you're like I'm thinking? Just trying to capture a mood. You know what I mean? Working with Fat Joe, you can't make anything sound happy. So you want to think about something that sounds dark but still will move people and, you know, has a pulse and has life to it. And knowing about music, you're able to, you know, pick, you know, different chords and come up with different things that, you know, feel like, oh, this is like more of a Fat Joe kind of sound. Yeah. I mean, you know what? These kind of records, I tend to stay away from like chords. I got into a period where now a melody, a single note melody that's happening repetitiously was where I was at. That was the phase I was going through. And it worked. Is, is there any specific reason why you were avoiding chords? Just because I felt like the records that are most memorable in history always have that familiar melody. Like some of my biggest hits, like the candy shop is do, 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 do. And you, like you remember that melody or, or, you know, all of them, you know, if, if you listen back to them, you'll, you'll see that they're less chord driven. Are there any like of your like favorite songs back in the day that that give you that feeling that made you want to make music like that? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are. It's hard <laughs> to think of, per se, which ones, but yeah, definitely. So what was that session like? Like, did you, did you know automatically, like, you know, we got one? No. No? No, I, I mean, I made the beat and the intro, and then six months later, I got a call. He's like, yo, we got a record, sick record. Mm-hmm. And he dropped my name in a record, which was a game changer for me and it helped my business so much. You know, and people now knew who I was. Or they were, well, they didn't know who I was, but they knew my name and they knew they wanted to buy some music from me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this was a different era, too, than today where you have the drops. The tags. and Yeah. The, yeah. yeah, so that, this Lean Back, it became your, kind of your calling card. A little bit, right? yeah. And then a lot of people that were coming to me for beats were Scott Storch on the beginning of their beat, right? Because you know there was a value in that. Maybe that you know people would mess with. It. And so around this time, you know, what was what was your life like? You were in Miami at this time. You know, you're making a lot of records. You're, you, I think this is a very prolific period for you. When do you get into making "Make It Rain"? Make it rain. I mean, it was just like almost like a, you know, anniversary of the lean back thing. Like, you know what I mean? We made that and then it was like, okay, what are we going to do now? And I remember Joe said, what we need to do is we got to make that double halftime record that's like some, he called it down south at the time. That's some down south shit. 
and um, and did it. And I had to like you know kind of take a crash course in that type of drum production. And you know, I feel like records like that sort of led to what inevitably trap music became. Yeah, I would agree with that. I feel like it was really prefigured trap music, what he did there. Um, and I feel like um, it reminds me a lot of like the snap music and stuff that was going to come out like around then, a little bit after that. A lot of the Atlanta sound, it, it, I feel like this song was actually very influential to that. So um, did, did you meet Lil Wayne like yeah. before that? Like, yeah. yeah, all so. the time. I remember I was, I had this, we were working all at the Hit Factory and I had a room there locked out for like a year. And um, they had a studio above mine and Wayne and everybody used to like, there was like a little balcony and they used to look over what was going on. And like Fat Joe always describes it as like a cheese line. But I literally had the parking lot filled with the top 10 people in music at the time waiting for their two hours to come up. And it was, it was crazy. How did that feel? It was amazing. A lot of pressure. And I, you know, I, I started like having like, you know, maybe I bought a Ferrari or something, but I didn't get a chance to drive it. It just sat in the parking lot at the studio and that was it. I would go out and look at it and be like, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't going to clubs. I wasn't doing anything. It was all work and that's what it takes. You were working. Yeah. Amazing. So let me fire that up. Make it rain. Fat Joe and Little Wayne. Yeah. I got into a lot of fights with my friends over that song. Really? Because they were mad at me. They were like, listen, I'm going broke from that song. <laughs> I was in the strip club, and <laughs> I was like, all right, no more of that. It was like a revolution, though, because like yeah. people, I really feel like that song popularized that phrase, yeah. you know, and I feel like at, the, at this time in your career, you know, like 2006, 2007, you're really making it rain, like in real life as well. Like your whole life was making it rain. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in 2006, you won the ASCAP Award for Songwriter of the Year. We had like 30 weeks at number one that year. It was everywhere, I remember, like yeah. super hype. And you know, I feel like it, it, it also could be like the soundtrack of your life at that time because you know, you, you had been made a lot of money at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, and it's like you're, you're in Miami, you've, got, you've obviously been working a lot, but then when you're not working, you're hanging at the crib. And you know, how, how successful were you at that point? Like you, you, you'd put out how many number one singles or whatever, like a, a untold. Lot. Yeah, it was, you know? it was, the numbers were crazy. So I just want to verify some things with you about you, you, the level of fame and success you had at this time. You know, I read in the autobiography of Gucci Mane uh, that when he went to your mansion, he said that uh, the guy was living like Scarface. Literally. So, <laughs> like, fly Problem. pelican, fly pelican fly. Like, you were spending so much money, you made Gucci Man go, whoa, this guy is spending a lot. So I just wanted to ask you some quick questions just to set the record straight, you know? Um, so I've heard conflicting reports around that time. You had over $70 million. I've also read $100, $100 million. I, would that be accurate? I'm not sure the exact numbers, but it, it was, yeah, and that's the ballpark, what it was. But, you know, I, I was, um, at one point, I was making so much money and I wasn't spending it. And then... Some people came into my life and kind of like took me out of the studio and that world and showed me what the club is and what being uh, a star is. And all of a sudden I was like famous for the wrong reasons. And I kind of painted myself into a corner and becoming this lavish person. And then I stopped working and I wasn't, I was just partying. And that's where the money started going the other direction. Is it true that you had a $20 million yacht? Mm, close. Like 15. Well, what was the name of the yacht? Uh, Tiffany was one of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you had a private jet? Yeah, I'm sort of. I mean, I, I, was, I was always in a private jet. You, you I were had always timeshares on them, and, you know. 
Because I'm just, hours. I, I'm wondering if this story is true. So I read that you used to be, you'd be in Miami hanging out with people at your crib, and then you'd be like, man, you know what? I really feel like going gambling. Um, and then you'd get on a private jet and you'd all fly to Las Vegas and then come back the same night. And be not like, the same Not night. the same night? No? no I, there was a story that I, you know, I, I told in an interview where I was actually at a club and I took everybody from the entire VIP to Vegas that was in there with us and got a floor at the hotel. And it was <laughs> debauchery. And probably about six or $700,000 later, I was like, I think I need to go home. But, you know, I was playing a role and, you know, I got into the, the you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking about life the right way. Right. I was trying to be like this figure, like a king or something. And, you know, I didn't want to just be a regular person. I, you know. what, what made you want to do that? Cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Cocaine and, and, and women, trying to impress women and... You know, trying to be the biggest fish in the pond in Miami. You know, that's probably hard too. You know, I was yeah, it's hard. It's a hell of a drug. It's um, hard, yeah. So in August 2006, you decided to take a break and go go to Hollywood. Um, so what were you doing around that time? You went you went over there and just to like uh, take a short hiatus, get out of Miami, or like what was the vibe? I mean, I was chasing Paris Hilton around. Unfortunately, I don't know why, but um, I'm just keeping it real. I don't know what I was thinking about. Um, but I was definitely going down the wrong path, and um, that's what happened. So uh, I read from between August 2006 and January 2007, you uh, spent $30 million dollars. Was there ever a point where you thought, hey, I might be spending too much money? I thought I was invincible at the time. Yeah. You know, it, it just was coming so fast, and it was, I wasn't working, and it was still coming, so I didn't realize it, that it's going to slow down. So knowing what you know now, is there any specific financial advice you'd give to any of the young artists out here? Yeah. Live within your means, and, um, you know... Do the right thing with your money and, and buy a house that you can afford and buy things you can afford, really, honestly, and stay away from drugs. Straight up. Respect your life and your craft. Yeah, so on that note, I want to play just another one of your big hits. Um, how did you get involved with 50 Cent? Well, you know, my relationship, obviously, with Dre and M was, you know, real tight. So he wanted to take a trip down to Miami, and he came and worked with me. <clears throat> I bought this house that I used exclusively for studios, and he came and we, we knocked out just a little bit in candy shop the same day. Yeah. So I'm going to put on candy shop. <clears throat> candy shop was actually originally supposed to be for Fat Joe, by the way. Yeah. But he thought it was too poppy. Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> Candy shop. So I feel like, yeah, that's, uh, again, going into, like, kind of Middle Eastern influences. I mean, so how did you actually compose that beat? Can you, can you break it down any further? I mean, I was, you know, you know, dead on, you know, trying to capture some Middle Eastern type of vibe, but you're not... I wanted it to be sonically, I wanted it to sound sexy, so I used some warm strings and used the right pitch bends on it and just just made a groove, you know what I mean? That was a real simple beat. That was like, that was all feeling right there. Sometimes it's no labor, you just, it just comes right out. What would you say the most like com complex beat you ever made would be? I made a few, like some stuff I did with Christina Aguilera was real epic. Mm -hmm. Fighter and they have huge breakdowns. I mean, the Beyonce stuff was like Baby Boy was pretty sophisticated, and I did a whole like Middle Eastern section that was available in the video, not for the radio version, but it was pretty crazy. Right. Yeah. And then you know, after you know the Miami, you go into L.A., you go into rehab. There's you know, during this period, you were you were you still making a lot of music? Were you? very productive at that time? 
I was not making the best music. I would go in, you know, sometimes and make whatever I thought, you know, was was good. But usually the next day when you sober up and you hear it, it wasn't <laughs> probably like those kind of drugs. They're not good in the studio. Your your mind is all over the place. You know, what I mean, it's like emotional roller coaster. So you, you know, you can't vibe like that. It just doesn't work. Well, it's it's the kind of thing that makes you feel like every idea you have is the best idea yeah. ever. Yeah, and it's like you're not even hearing things properly. Like when you do that, like 10k frequency cuts off. You don't even hear that. So you're overcompensating the high end and stuff like that. You know. I think that's a lesson in and of itself already for yeah. producers, you know. Um, but yeah, then you know there was that that kind of um, brief period of inactivity, and then how did you get to work with Big Boy? Um, I, you know, he saw it working with me, and you know, it was funny. I made that song, and I, you know, it was like squeaking by. I like the beat. I think it's an incredible song, and it was just a random thing that just. I got lucky with it, a bad time in my life, and and I remember him coming over, and he was like, "Man, I heard rumors, but it seems like everything's okay here." And he was, you know, he was couldn't be any more wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I hid it from him. You know what I mean? Yeah, because I mean, like the at the time, like there's the rumors of you like having a session with like Janet Jackson and just being like ten hours late or something. Or is that yeah, I left her. I think at my house one time we were in the middle of working and I wanted to like go do something. I don't know, remember what it was, but I left her there for like eight hours. <laughs> it was not not the right thing to do. No. <laughs> I feel like that's something you learned from though, for sure. But you didn't do that to Big Boy, and you guys yeah. ended up making Shutterbug, yeah. which is such an awesome track. Um, the composition of that, I feel like, is very interesting because there's the kind of vocoder going on and it's in, in the beat. Who, who is that doing the vocoder? Um, yeah, it was somebody that he brought in after the fact. Oh, oh okay. Okay, so that part yeah. was added. That was added, yeah. Yeah, but it's still the it's beat. more treated like a vocal, yeah. Okay, cool, because it's like really blended in there. And then there's like more of it later, and it's like, it's, it's a really interesting track. Yeah. Um, and the video was sick, too. Yeah, the video was totally awesome. And I feel like... Um, you seem to work with artists at really crucial times in their career. I've noticed that throughout your career. You know, the first Justin Timberlake album, the first Beyonce album, and then you have Big Boy's real first solo album after, you know, outside of Outkast, and the first single is by you. You know, it's, it's one thing to get a hit with somebody that's got a million hits already, but it's another thing to, like, bring somebody out and give them their first hit which is cool. Like with Chris Brown, for example, when he came into my studio, he was just a kid. And that day we, we penned a song and it went to number one. It was his first song ever out, Run It. And uh, I, liked, I liked making careers happen, you know what I mean? Starting, that's more yeah. of an achievement. I think that's exciting. So I'm gonna put on Shutterbug by Big Boy. I also like the, uh, the reference to like the system oh, yeah. that they put in there with the vocal. Um, I also feel like that track is also very unlike anything Big Boy had ever done before, too. Yeah. Or me. I, I think it's very different. Mm -hmm. And so you were, you were talking before about, you know, you like to be like the, the person to like give somebody like their first hits and stuff. And I feel like that's become a big thing in your career like more recently because you've been working with a lot of like the newer rappers. Some people might want to call them SoundCloud rappers, you know, somebody like uh, you've been working with Russ a lot, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, Trippy Red, you know, you, you have uh, the track uh, with Young Thug, Daddy's Birthday, you know, like um, what is it like working with the new generation? I'll tell you what, when I finally decided to make the move and clean my life up. <clears throat> I joined forces with Steve LaBelle. We working. He's in the audience right there. And Steve told me the importance of working with new artists again. Because when I came back in, I was like, oh, we got to call Beyonce. We got to call this one. It's like making new music with new artists and get in touch with the culture and the kids are going to love you again. And he was right. And we watched a bunch of really new artists turn into some successful new artists. 
I feel like you, you you're you adding your music to like the to the new styles of today is really um you've added this uh, extra level of musicality that I think is really missing in a lot of the new rap. Um, what do you think of the production of rap today, or the, the trap music, let's say, specifically? I mean, I, you know, again, I, there's a lot of crap out there, but there's a lot of amazing stuff out there. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of producers that still put uh, energy into the craft and are making quality music. Um, I like collaborating with producers these days a lot. Like, you know, a young, hungry kid that makes trap beats and just programs the drums next to me playing my melodies works because it's like, a, you know, it's like a cheat code almost. You got everything. All the elements are covered. Mm-hmm. Like you did uh, that track for Young Thug with London on the track? Yep. Um, what was that like? What was that? Were you in the studio together working on that? Or? You know, London and I, we made like four or five beats in one day and that was one of them and he was like, he called me, he was like, yo, Thug loves this track. Let's do it. It was, it was cool. And it's cool because it's very unlike anything he's done before. But it feels very natural, too. And I feel like that's the same with the Trippy Red track that you did. Uh, I'm going to play that one. I feel like it's so interesting. Also, it's the first track of yours that I've heard that has uh, the tag on it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like this is very contemporary. Yeah. So, so y'all going to know I'm working. Because <laughs> <laughs> some records get passed over. Like I just did something with Post Malone on his album, and I didn't put a tag on it. And, Nobody knows I'm even on the album, so because people don't read credits anymore. That's the sad part. Which track is that? Um, Zach and Cody. Now's the time. But yeah, I'm gonna play the track "Taking a Walk" by Trippy Red. I love this song. So. What would you say the difference between, you know, working with rappers, you know, in the 90s, early 2000s, and rappers today? Like, what, what is the difference between working with them? I mean, I don't want to offend anybody with this answer, <laughs> but I, I feel like it's more melodic today, and people were spitting bars more before. And, you know, but, you know, I mean, it's... Everybody has their own style, you know what I mean? I'm finding a lot of these cats, like have their, what they bring to the table. Like Trippy, he brings, like he's almost like a rock star. And he's like very daring in what he does. He played me a video like two days ago for his new song coming out. <clears throat> and he like skipped right past Marilyn Manson. And he went to like <laughs> Charlie Manson. I don't know what it was. <laughs> but, but he's, you know, he's an innovator, man, a pioneer, which is the most important kind of musician to be. It seems like a lot of the new rappers today too. They're they're so much more like prolific and more productive, and like they just have a different like way of working than I, th- I what I've like read and what I've experienced like meeting older rappers. And I think it's refreshing, you know. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to the aspiring producers out there? Be a pioneer. Always listen to what's in the market, but make it your own and create and you know be the guy that creates the new sound not just copies what's out there break ground and stay strong and don't give up i think that's a a great note for us to end on give it up for scott storch